occupational biology. Um, and I'm very honored to be invited today and give a talk and introduce some of my recent works and lesson learned from studying omics and multi-omics QTLs in various tissue types. Um, and um, uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, the title of my talk today is Integrated Genomic Association and Mediation Analysis. It consists of two main parts. Um, and um, the major part that I want to introduce is to um, do integrative association analysis. And later on, we try to move a little bit uh, beyond association and do um, a little bit towards uh, uh, mediation analysis. Um, so uh, I'll pause in the middle, see if you have any questions. I don't want to lose the audience uh, for an entire talk. So hopefully in the middle, we can catch up a little bit. Um, the idea of our first part of the work was motivated by integrating GWAS and um, EQTL and multi-omics QTL summary statistics from multiple tissue types. Um, and we later generalized to a slightly more complex model, allowing data to have a hierarchical structure. Um, in the second half, we apply this integrative association methods to uh, a few uh, different um, fields beyond just association. Um, the whole work and idea was um, because we are very interested in studying genetics. And, and in the past decade or so, there has a lot of um, success in genome-wide association studies in linking SNPs to uh, various human complex diseases and traits. Uh, every time I cite an NHGRI catalog, I have to refer back to the website because the number of unique associations is constantly increasing. It's updated sometimes in a, a monthly basis and sometimes more frequent. Um, the last time I checked it, comparing with earlier this, this month, it's another bump. There are many, many GWAS findings uh, linking uh, SNPs to complex traits. Um, but uh, you may know that over 90% of those GWAS SNPs are in non-coding regions with unknown functions. And exactly how those SNPs affect complex traits is um, still unknown for many of them. Um, so, a major research interest in the post-genome um, time is people want to understand the biological mechanisms underlying those GWASNIMs, not just the identification, but people want to know how. And the one natural mechanism is to study the genetic deregulated expression or other omics traits. Um, and one hypothesis the SNMs may affect a gene expression, especially a local gene expression first. Um, and the gene expression change and um, increase or decrease the uh, complex disease risk. Um, and their earlier literature have shown those GWAS SNPs, trade associated SNPs are more likely to be EQTL. Um, and EQTL is defined as the genetic variance associated with a gene expression, the MRA level. The EQTL can be in cis means the SNPs affects, the variance or SNPs affects a local gene expression, uh, or it can also be trans, means some of the SNPs may affect a distal expression on a, a different chromosome or very far away from the gene. Um, so various research has shown many of the um, um, GWAS SNPs are enriched with EQTL. In addition to EQTL, um, genetic factors may regulate other omics traits, for example, DNA methylation, um, or protein abundance, or splicing DNA's hypersensitivity, histomultiplication, and many, many other different omics data types. And recent literature also shows that uh, those GWAS names are also enriched with but those omics QTLs. 
um, in one of our earlier work, we show that uh, a lot of times EQTLs and the methylation QTLs may share causal variants. Here is a picture. You can see that the blue dots represent the uh, methylation QTL signal. The, uh, sorry, the red dots represent the methylation QTL signal, and the um, blue dots represent the cis EQTL signal. In many of the genes we identified, you see the EQTL profile um, um, shows very similar pattern, and uh, uh, they're pointing to a same causal variance. On the other hand, there are also many unique EQTLs and the unique methylation QTLs that are independent from each other. So those different omics data types pointing you to um, um, potentially overlapping and orthogonal um, information that they jointly can explain, can possibly explain why GWAS SNPs is affecting complex diseases, why those SNPs with weak and moderate effects um, may altogether affecting um, the disease risk. Um, our group is part of the GTEx consortium, um, and the Genotype Tissue Expression Project um, is one of the largest projects to study the genetic regulation on um, different um, uh, uh, on expression and different omics QTLs, also from a multi-tissue perspective. Uh, the GTEC consortium at this stage uh, is at the version 8 release. Uh, recently, the whole consortium has released a few uh, new paper in science and genome biology. Um, basically, um, the genetic regulation on gene expression and the many other omics traits are quite dynamic. Their effects can vary substantially across tissue types and cell types. Um, so a cis-EQTL may be a cis-EQTL in this tissue, but not in that other tissue. Maybe a cis-EQTL in this cell type, but not in other cell type. Maybe a cis-EQTL at this stage of a development um, of human, but not in other stage. So when you consider EQTL, you not only need to consider whether it's, there is association, but also need to consider the operating context or even developmental stage. Um, with that in mind, um, in the GTEx recent release, there are a very abundant amount of cis EQTLs being detected. Um, nearly all the protein coding genes have at least one cis EQTL in each tissue type. Uh, on the other hand, trans EQTL, those distal, those EQTLs affecting a distal gene are um, still underpowered. Um, it, there are many reasons behind it. If we have time, we can talk about this in the second half of this talk. Um, before people think the cis EQTLs are generally cross tissue um, and they should be very stable. Um, in fact, with the GTEx analysis, we find that um, many cis EQTLs are indeed cross tissue, but a lot of them are also tissue specific. More importantly, the lead ESNIP for a gene are often very different in different tissue types. Some of them may even have um, opposite effect size. So just assuming cis EQTL can be replicated across different studies or different uh, cellular contexts is probably not enough. Just taking one of the EQTL reference uh, uh, in, the, in the subsequent integrative or association analysis is potentially also only capturing partial picture of this whole dynamic regulatory um, system. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, there are many cis EQTLs. Um, GTEx not only studies cis uh, expression QTL, but they also um, have data on sublicing QTL. Um, my collaborator and I are working on multi-tissue methylation QTL. The data will be released hopefully soon. Um, and when jointly consider all those omics QTL in different tissue types, um, many of them may share cause, the same causal variants, but in fact, you also see there are many secondary QTLs in each region. 
There are many unique omics QTLs. There are many tissue-specific QTLs. So the talk today is motivated by the fact that the genetic regulation on those different omics QTLs can be so dynamic and diverse. So you need a comprehensive consideration of many of those different information. Um, in a recent review by the color in red, um, if you're interested in my slides, I can send it to you later. Um, uh, and my email is, uh, you, can, you can search it too. In this review, um, I, I think it, uh, um, there is a, a, a conclusion that a lot of the GTEx people agreed on is um, common EQTLs are, um, especially cis EQTLs, common EQTLs are highly utilized in the current literature but in fact, many of them are very weakly selected, which is very intuitive. If some EQTL, if some genetic regulatory effects affects the fitness um, and is disease related, um, then either the uh, fitness burden is low or weakly selected, or um, they will be, um, maybe will be diminished after generation. So, on the other hand, many of those disease-associated EQTLs may be either very weak or they are operating in a tissue-specific or cell-type-specific pattern. And um, just serving you, doing the survey, serving in the uh, very large sample, trying to detect the robust QTLs would be very helpful to detect those common EQTLs, but maybe they carry a more likely an indirect effect to the uh, various complex diseases. Um, on the other hand, uh, more attention should be paid to those tissue-specific and cell-type-specific QTLs. The challenge associated with some is they could be so dynamic and uh, with limited sample size, trying to detect them um, uh, could be challenging and um, the uh, uh, false positive uh, could also be uh, uh, very uh, common too, false positive finding. So um, a major theme in the work that I'm going to talk about, introduce today, is uh, not just considering one EQTL sets of summary statistics from a large data, because that's more likely to be the, uh, the common EQTL in one tissue type, um, may or may not be translated to the really disease relevant cell context. Um, so a, a, a major theme that in my work today is trying to consider, jointly consider multi-tissue or multi-omics QTL when integrating with GWAS statistics or trying to um, explain the mechanism underlying GWAS NANS. Um, some review of um, some related works. One type of message is called colocalization analysis. Colocalization analysis um, take, in, take as input the one set of GWAS summary statistics and one set of EQTL summary statistics, trying to identify the shared causal variance in the region that is responsible for both the complex traits and the gene expression. That is potentially causal for both expression and complex traits. Um, there are some existing and widely used methods, for example, Colloc. Um, the same group later extend the methods to um, more, than, more than two sets of summary statistics, but still very small, called Moloch. Uh, usually one or two EQTL with one GWAS. Um, one limitation of those methods is they assume there is only one causal variance in the region, um, but that assumption is generally not true. A large proportion of the region um, have secondary GWAS signal, have secondary um, EQTLs, um, and so uh, that assumption is constantly violated. Um, more often, uh, the one challenge associated with those existing methods is 
they only consider one QTL, at most two QTL and um, GWAS at a time, um, because some of those methods requires some prior specification once you, um, like how often you see an EQTL, how often you see an EQTL and isolation QTL. So those needs to be specified by the user and the methods could be very sensitive to those priors. So with those challenges in mind, um, here I want to show one example that potentially people um, may look at one GWAS names that I circled in, in the red box. Um, that GWAS names is the, the red dot. Um, and a confounding names in the region is the blue cross. If you only take the GWAS summary statistic, uh, and this is the GWAS summary statistic from the breast cancer, naturally you may look at the breast tissue EQTL from GTEx and trying to find colocalization. In this case here, the, the known GWAS names is actually the blue, uh, sorry, is the red dot. It doesn't have a strong EQTL in this region. So the colocalization probability may be low in this case, at least not very high. Um, but if you also consider multi-omics QTLs from other data set, you will see that this GWAS name um, is not an EQTL in the normal breast tissue, but after adjusting for copy number variation and other covariates, it's constantly showing as a EQTL in the uh, um, breast tumor tissue, um, also a methylation QTL and a PQTL in the breast tumor tissue. Although um, I have to admit that the, Q the genetic effects in tumor tissue is uh, pretty noisy is confounded by copy number variation and um, other complications in tumor cells. Um, it's not the ideal sets of QTL to study if you uh, are trying to understand GWAS. Um, but when you aggregating different sets of those um, QTLs from different cellular operating contexts, you see that um, the majority of voting says this is indeed a QTL, this is indeed a GWAS name that potentially affect the gene expression in this gene um, and in many different ways, in many different, through many different omics traits. Um, this example, again, um, considering that most existing methods can only analyze a small number of, of QTL and one GWAS at a time, um, this example shows that because of the dynamic regulatory pattern of uh, genetic on omics traits, um, you may want to consider a comprehensive list of omics traits and multi-tissue omics traits in various contexts. Um, so in our first work, we presented an algorithm that we named as the PRIMO. It's essentially a multi-omic association algorithm. Um, I'll show the basic idea, but leave the details for interesting readers, and uh, you can find the paper. Um, the paper is published earlier this year. Um, the idea is, say, we have, we jointly want to consider J different studies. This can be omics traits, or they can be um, the EQTL from uh, multi multiple tissue. We allow those different studies to be potentially correlated. So there are um, two to the power of J possible association patterns if each study may be, um, if for each SNP, it may be associated, maybe not associated. In, altogether, there are two to the power of J possible association patterns. Um, and altogether, if say we have three um, different sets of summary statistics, there are those eight possible outcomes. Um, in the genome, the SNPs will follow those eight possible outcomes, one of those eight, with different um, proportion, with different highs, frequencies. Um, and so essentially, we'll translate this into, translate the association analysis into more like a clustering problem. Um, and instead of trying to estimate two to the power of J different possible uh, association patterns, the density for those 
um, we simplified it into um, that for each study, we can consider each study may have um, a no distribution and an alternative distribution. Those are being approximated. And the no distribution is more like an empirical no, the alternative is more like an approximated alternative. And then we can um, estimate the joint density, um, changing this calculation of two to the power of j, that many of multivariate density into um, a linear problem. I'll show the detail on the next slides. But once we estimate the density, we can use the data to estimate the proportions of those different patterns and calculate the probability that how a SNP may fall into each of those different patterns. So when J is moderate, like 3 to 5, 3 to, to even 10, um, this is the basic idea of that um, model. Again, the detail is how to estimate the DK, the multivariate density for each of the pattern. Um, for example, here, we are interested in this pattern. This is uh, associated in the first study, not associated in the second, and, but associated in the third. Um, the interpretation for this pattern is the SNP is an EQTL, but not a methylation QTL, and the SNP is associated with this trait. Um, we may first estimate the density of this um, pattern comparing with others and um, estimate a pi and get the, the probability of how likely the SNP follows this pattern. So how to estimate the DK? Uh, again, the simple idea is we decompose the multivariate density potentially allowing different studies to be correlated into two separate problems. One is we will estimate the density for each of the study, the empirical no and the empirical alternative for each of the study, first assuming all the studies are independent. Um, so we use this idea similar to the uh, existing lemma methods um, to approximate the empirical no and alternative density. And uh, again, assuming everything is independent, every study is independent, we can model the multivariate density just using the joint density product. But we know the studies are not independent, especially if we are analyzing study like GTEx. Uh, we know there are substantial sample overlap. Um, but the sample overlap is some um, correlation that are present under the null. So you may estimate the sample overlap under the null, assuming this is the same um, for all SNPs across the genome and, uh, and incorporate it into the multivariate density. So through this simplification, we um, a wide estimation of two to the power of J, that many of density problem and translate more into a linear um, estimation problem that um, save the sum of the uh, computation. Um, we uh, um, then estimated the, the pies in the data through EM and um, calculate the posterior probability and the false discovery rate. Um, the algorithm we also extended to uh, integrating um, not just the t-statistic, but also chi-square statistics. Uh, or p-values, so allowing one-sided p-value, allowing the, uh, say, we only want to integrate the signals that are having the same sign of the effect, that they are all positive. Um, that way you may just um, um, transform the p-value into a chi-square um, statistic. Um, the similar idea apply. Um, the, diff the minor difference is how you approximate the empirical null and the empirical alternative um, based on the observed um, test statistic. We just used uh, um, uh, this approximation, uh, assuming the test statistic entered the alternative follow a mixture of chi-square, and we approximate the tail. Um, simulation shows uh, very good performance. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate on that. Um, details can be found in our genome biology paper. Um, 
Moreover, once you identify the association, you can also extend it to detect the conditional associations through a conditional multivariate framework. Um, and here is one example that if in this region, you already have, it's a hypothetical example, if you already have two other uh, lead names from other omic theta type or from other tissue type, you may adjust them and consider them in the conditional association framework um, to reduce false positive findings. Um, so this work, um, as the uh, first analysis along this direction to integrate GWA summary statistics with multi-omics data from multiple cellular contexts, um, I would say it steps beyond just analyzing one or two EQTL at a time, but the limitation is still it can only integrate a lower number of QTL summary statistics because we need to essentially still estimate the uh, joint density to two to the power of J that many of patterns. When we have 10 tissue types, that's like a thousand different patterns. Some of those patterns are so sparse that can be collapsed, but even so, um, the computation will increase substantially with the number of studies you consider. Um, we know that the GTEx consortium has um, nearly 50 different human tissue types. So two to the power of 50 is a very, very large number. Um, so when J is moderately large, you, we literally can consider two to the power of J that many of different centroid and can, um, it will be challenging to apply the similar idea of framework. Um, moreover, um, there is additional omics data types and I'm going to introduce a little bit very soon. So those motivate us to want to further extend this framework um, when we consider GWAS with uh, multi-omics QTLs. Um, some QTLs are from um, multiple tissue. We want to have an algorithm potentially allow us to do a very comprehensive characterization of the dynamic pattern of regulation of those QTLs. Um, but in a data reduction fashion uh, with a simpler structure and considering some are more correlated, some are distally correlated. So in the um, next part, we're going to introduce our hierarchical latent low rank methods. Um, this method is still work in progress, so I, I would only show uh, limited uh, results, but I'll present the idea. So this hierarchical late, latent low rank integration was initially motivated to uh, integrate an even larger number of EQTLs um, and potentially also integrating QTLs of a different omics data type. So when you integrate two sets of QTLs, um, some of those effect sizes can be on completely different scale. Even if you standardize them, some EQTLs and methylation QTLs may be of opposite effect size. So um, we don't want to assume um, too many um, assumptions on the effect size or distribution. Um, so we want to allow the data to be flexibly, but also correlated. Um, here are some preliminary studies when we jointly analyzing the multi-tissue EQTL and the methylation QTL from the GTEx data. Um, here we want to still trying to do co-localization, see um, how many uh, what proportion of GWAS um, SNMs are also EQTLs or methylation QTLs in at least the one tissue type and in many tissue types. Um, so here are some of the study when we just apply existing methods. Um, we did an exhaustive search for 86 GWAS um, and trying to do co-localization, see if the GWAS SNPs are also EQTL or methylation QTL in some of the tissue types, in at least the one tissue. Um, 
here is a, an example that there are a, a abundant of um, uh, a GWAS names that are colocalized to a methylation QTL, but there is no EQTL present. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the genetic regulation of expression can be dynamic. Um, and some of the gene expression are also being regulated by multiple various factors. And can be, maybe if there is a EQTL, but uh, was later suppressed by other factors. Um, so TURD is one of the genes that is known to relate it to many different functions. And uh, we are interested in um, arsenic. Um, here we see that the TURD doesn't have an EQTL in most of the tissues, um, but there is a constant cross-tissue methylation QTL. And the, um, the picture, the methylation QTL profile lines up uh, very nicely with the GWAS uh, um, plot too, um, showing that there is a colocalization. So methylation QTL in this example here explain the potential, at least partial mechanism, why this NIMS is affecting breast cancer in, um, in, in um, um, breast tissue. Um, if we look at the entire genome, the orange circle represents the methylation QTLs we identified um, through survey of nine tissue types and the, uh, the crayon color represent the EQTLs because each gene may have multiple CPG sites. So there could be a lot of more methylation QTLs detected than EQTL at the same FDR level. Um, even if our methylation QTL actually have much lower sample size than the GTEx EQTL. And there are only a small proportion of them are commonly shared. Um, in the picture below, we also see the um, Orange color are, EQT, are unique EQTLs. Green are um, multi-omics QTL that are affecting both EQTL and the methylation QTL. And blue are methylation specific, only unique methylation, but no EQTLs for um, those SNPs. And um, different bars represent different traits uh, and colocalization. You see a survey of those 86 GWAS um, studies a different proportion, a varying proportion of contribution from unique methylation QTL, unique EQTLs, and, and the multi-omics QTLs. So they can be all possible and they can be all present. Um, they each uh, could also happen too. So with that being said, uh, again, when you jointly consider the mechanism how SNPs may affect complex traits, you may, <laughs> there is another layer is um, multi-omics QTL. Um, so again, back to our statistical question is, we want to integrate this rich and dynamic data with GWAS through uh, summary statistics only. Um, so we want to capture the major pattern um, and somewhat uh, reduce the dimensionality of the data um, because it's, very computationally expensive to consider two to the power of 40 different tissue types and two to the power of 10 different methylation QTL. Um, so we propose this uh, idea called the hierarchical low rank integration. The idea is basically based on the fact that there is a bimodal pattern of tissue sharing in CCQTL and similar bimodal pattern is also observed in methylation QTL. Here we only present the CCQTL um, uh, tissue sharing pattern um, to just illustrate the idea. In the um, plot on the right, you see a U shape um, and the uh, uh, green color, the light green color represent the CCQTL and the uh, coffee color represent the trans EQTL. The, those are all EQTL. And uh, on the X axis, this is the estimated number of tissue with a non-zero effects, um, and you see the proportion of genes on the y-axis. The two bars on the left and on the right shows the proportion of tissue-specific QTLs on the left, and on the right it shows more like a cross-tissue QTL. 
Again, so many of the cis-EQTLs are cross-tissue, but even for cis-EQTL, still a substantial proportion of them are tissue-specific. Like I mentioned earlier, that people believe that the truly deleterious QTLs are likely to be um, maybe tissue-specific, but you can also imagine a lot of those common EQTLs, um, maybe the developmental EQTLs, they can indirectly affect the uh, complex traits and diseases. For example, some of the common EQTLs may affect the BMI. BMI can further affect a lot of others. So um, when we jointly consider those multi-omics QTL in various conditions, um, instead of when the data dimension becomes very, very large, instead of trying to ask which tissue, which cell type, um, if we want to analyze in a more efficient way, um, we think that the major pattern here is, is it tissue specific or is it um, more like cross tissue? So the idea of hierarchical integration is essentially motivated by this, that we think if a um, methylation QTL is tissue specific because methylation generally affects the expression, although there are reverse effects too, but it, it's more like methylation more commonly affects expression. So um, we believe if the methylation QTL is tissue specific, then EQTR are also likely to be tissue specific. So there is some overlapping of the nature of those um, tissue sharing of EQTR effects. So here is our model. Uh, let beta be just the EQTR effects. You know, we first introduced this model in just the multi-tissue EQTL. Let beta be the observed uh, um, EQTR effects from summary statistics. Um, we assume the beta um, follow a normal distribution, that the mean of beta is the true EQTR effects times uh, association status. This association status is binary. If it's one, means this is a, a cross-tissue EQTL, or if there is an EQTL. Um, if it's zero, then it's um, a no EQTL. So it's just association, it doesn't necessarily imply it's cross tissue or not cross tissue, sorry. Um, and we allow the uh, um, different studies to be correlated. Um, so the true beta is uh, one of the latent factors that we aim to model. Um, the hierarchical low rank, the low rank is essentially, um, we're assuming that um, when we talked about this latent binary association status, this association status has a low rank um, structure. Um, the association status, um, when we um, consider the um, uh, logic transformation, and consider its posterior probability doing the logic tra transformation, we model the latent association status through a low rank matrix. So this way we will reduce the dimensionality of multi-tissue QTLs through this, um, um, you can think of it as a prior. Um, so when there is no structure in the data, you can assume this, this X is zero, and then the, um, um, the uh, association status is just the tissue specific. There are no bar information across different tissue types. Um, so we use a, a variational EM algorithm to estimate those parameters. Uh, the idea is we jointly consider the uh, latent variable, the association status, and the uh, true EQTL effect size. Um, and then uh, we try to maximize the uh, uh, lower bound uh, specified um, uh, above and uh, get a point estimate. Here is the algorithm. Uh, the basic algorithm is we'll initialize, um, estimate the posterior probability for a posterior distribution for the uh, uh, true EQTL effects and the posterior for the latent association status and then update it in, uh, through this low rank structure um, and to capture the major patterns, whether it's a tissue specific or cross tissue EQTL. And once we have two data sets, once we have both the EQTL and multi-tissue methylation QTL um, here, 
we may not just do a TCA, we may do a, a CCA, linking the major patterns of those two data structure together. Um, and it, and uh, um, we can also um, integrate it with um, GWAS. But at this moment, we, are, we just focus on GWAS names. Um, here is a simple illustrative simulation. We're just comparing our algorithm to versus ignoring um, the low rank structure. Um, I'm not going to elaborate on the simulation details, but the uh, analysis shows some improvement to consider the structure uh, of the low rank. And here are some examples that uh, we uh, applied the, uh, the previous, like I said, it's still work in progress, the hierarchical low rank. But we apply to the previous uh, to the previous algorithm to real data um, in um, explaining the GWAS names for a simple trade or explaining the um, pleiotropy effect in multiple tissue types. Um, generally, we find that integrating multi-omics data would give you substantial more power and more complete view of how um, GWAS names may um, dynamically play a role in the comprehensive pattern. There are other applications, um, potentially the Primo and the hierarchical LLR framework is basically a pretty general association matrix to test for non-omnibus association. Um, so we also have other applications too. So, um, that's the first part of my talk. Um, the next part, I'll, I'll only introduce in some general idea of how to uh, utilize this integrative association, multi-omics, multi-tissue association in a more general way. But before I go into the second part, which will be mostly just ideas, uh, I want to see if there is any question. Hi, uh, Professor Chen. That's a very uh, nice presentation. So I just have one quick question about the uh, your first project, uh, Primal. So yeah. basically, for example, if we have the uh, multiple key statistics and uh, uh, based on my understanding, you utilize the multivariate normal distribution to approximate those joint distribution of the T statistic, right? Yes. And uh, for the correlations, you utilize uh, the data from the non-space. So do you explain, can you explain a little bit why you are doing so instead of utilizing all of the key statistics to calculate the correlation? Uh, that's a good question. So we believe um, when you see, uh, let's say two QTLs that show correlation, we believe there are two source, at least two major source of correlation. One is due to potential sample overlapping. One is really due to a true biological correlation. Um, especially when you analyze GTEx data. GTEx are collecting multi-tissue data from the same sets of individuals. So maybe when I'm analyzing breast EQTL and ovarian EQTL, half of the sample are the same individual, but the other half, half are unique. So essentially, let me try to get to this slide. Essentially, um, when we, uh, um, uh, this correlation matrix estimated under the null is trying to capture the sample overlap. That source of correlation. That's, that's the correlation we are not interested in. Because later, if you analyze breast from GTEx, they analyze ovarian from, let's say, EQTL gen. Or, well, EQTL gen contains GTEx. Let's say a completely independent EQTL. Then there is no such correlation. So you are not interested in the sample overlapping. You are more interested in, like, um, in the genome, 10% of the EQTL uh, are always co-localized with um, uh, ovarian tissue EQTL. So you're more interested in those biological correlation, and that's a correlation under the alternative. Trying to use only the, the statistic under the node to ask me sample overlapping is to decompose this two source of correlation. Um, and the, uh, the biological correlation that you are more interested in, but it's completely unknown. How many EQTLs in breast are also EQTLs in 
methylation, uh, in, in, in ovarian, or how many PTLs are also methylation PTL. That is something we want to estimate from the data. That is captured by the PIK, which will estimate from the data. Okay, I see. So you are trying to modeling something of not our interest into our model to adjust for, so that what left is something of our interest uh, under the alternative. So yeah, this you is can also, yeah, you can also think it that way too. Okay, gotcha. Thank you so much. Uh, so I will use my, is, is this talk uh, one hour or? Um, Carlos, is this one hour talk? Yes, yes. And then we've got the uh, Q&A afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll use my um, rest 10 minutes to <laughs> talk about a broader application of multi-omics PTLs. Um, but I'm not probably going to the details. Uh, one is to further consider uh, not just association, but also mediation. Um, like I mentioned, it's a major challenge in the EQTL field or omics QTL field to study trans association. This is mostly because trans association generally are believed to be very problem, but with very weak effect size. Um, and many people think they are tissue specific or cell type specific. Um, there are also arguments saying that you, it's just so weak that you detected so many false positives so they don't replicate across studies. Um, in the recent EQTL gen consortium, they also published their results based on a much larger sample size. They found the abundant trans EQTLs. So this study, in my opinion, shows that um, power is the limiting factor to detect trends. Once you have a much larger sample size, there will be a lot of more trans EQTLs that can be replicated and detected. Um, so our idea is instead of just directly, like what they did, directly associating SNPs to trans genes, um, this is the genetic effect on something that is distal on a different chromosome. Our idea is, can we consider a natural mediator uh, for this mechanism? Can we study the SNMs that are affecting the cis gene and then affecting the trans gene? So this will um, essentially proposing a different type of test um, and the mediation analysis, there are also literature shows that if you find the right mediator, this mediation analysis is more powerful in detecting those weaker effects. Uh, well, those direct, uh, uh, directly testing for the total effects were more likely to detect those stronger effects. Um, and on previous literature, um, we also show that mediation effects are actually very prevalent in the genome. Many of them are partial mediation. In the MR literature, it's like with horizontal pleiotropy. But many of them are partial mediation with a, a direct effect from SNP to the trans gene. Um, so we basically, in this work, we propose that can we um, decompose this test into two parts, that we will jointly testing the cis association and the cis and trans gene correlation conditioning on the SNPs. So we'll treat the cis gene as a natural mediator. Um, so this way, um, one thing you will notice is SNP to cis gene association is the cis association I mentioned. It's very often to be cross tissue. Um, and a gene gene correlation conditioning on SNP, um, like a co-expressed gene or co-regulated gene, they also tend to be pretty stable, um, have effects shared among functionally related tissue types. So um, comparing this type of test, the mediation analysis versus a direct test, we argue that you are more likely to find association, distal trans associations that are sharing across functionally related tissue types and the interpretable and more robust and likely to uh, be mediated, uh, sorry, are likely to be replicated. Moreover, this is more like a complementary test to direct uh, association tests. They're likely to find different signals. Like I mentioned, this mediation type of test may be um, 
more powerful in detecting uh, those media factors while the uh, uh, standard association methods may be more powerful in detecting uh, total effects. Well, um, literature already show those standard association tests often detect trans associations are, that are tissue specific. We argue that through mediation, maybe you can borrow information across different tissue types. Um, so the idea of our test is quite simple. We will first get the cis association test statistics, and then we'll get the gene gene correlation test statistics. And um, one thing we argue is because we think both gene gene correlation and cis association tend to have effects shared among functionally related tissue types, so we'll do a joint analysis of multiple tissue types. Um, so here is essentially the, uh, um, the methods. We want to quantify this trans association through a cis-mediated gene um, in at least the K1 tissues out of K tissues. Um, and we decompose it into two tests, test for association times test for gene correlation. And for both tests, um, after some um, simplification for both tests, we can just obtain the summary level data and apply PRIMO uh, or apply the integrated methods. So essentially it's like uh, apply the integrated association methods that I introduced in this first half twice and it will give you results for the mediation. Um, of course, there are many other issues like how do you choose K, how do you choose um, K1? Um, so we are proposing Again, we uh, are proposing two type of analysis. One um, is called CC, CC MAD cross tissue mediation um, for gene level, or we later change it to most for most tissue type. Um, so for most tissue type, we jointly analyze 13 brain tissue and choose K1 to be um, a 12 out of 13. So it means majority of the brain tissue may have this uh, um, mediation effects. So I want to show some of the analysis um, that we identify through this message. We identify nine cells in cis EQTL set to cis gene to trans uh, relationships. Um, and we try to replicate them. Um, we try to replicate them using two independent data set. One is the EQTL gen trans um, EQTL results. Um, because EQTL gen only focus on disease associated SNMs, so the black dots are their SNMs reported. Those SNMs, even, um, uh, even if you randomly select those disease uh, associated SNMs, uh, they may be enriched with um, uh, EQTL. But you can see that the mediated pairs identified through our methods in the GTEx data, a completely independent data show a much higher enrichment of trans association than their random SNMs. Um, that's the, um, um, the green dots. Um, and on the right, we also see a strong replication in CMC data. Um, we analyze the GTEx brain data, but see a very strong replication in the common mind um, disease, the brain tissue. So this basically shows through this cross tissue mediation analysis, um, instead of directly testing the um, total effects um, um, by integrating model signals across multiple related tissue types, you may be able to find more robust trans associations. Um, I don't think I have the time for the uh, other work, but we also apply uh, an extension to detect trans genes for known GWAS names. Uh, it's a similar idea, but more targeting for tissue specific um, effects, tissue specific mediation effects. Um, and so we only consider as long as those um, mediation effects shows in two tissue types, we will play them, claim them. Um, and we also see a strong um, um, replication, slightly higher replication than just considering single tissue type. Um, next, I don't have the time, but um, we are, uh, we also have a related work in integrating multi-omics 
um, QTLs in the transcriptome Mendelian randomization framework. The main message is um, by considering, uh, because the EQTL effects is so dynamic, it can be cross tissue, can be tissue specific. Simply consider the EQTL from blood, assuming it will be replicated in your GWAS study. It's probably not enough because the, the, the IV may, may be, if you consider the EQTL to be an IV, the IV may be so weak, there is a low chance to be replicated. So we're proposing that maybe you can consider those um, uh, cross-tissue EQTLs in this framework. Um, so there are some interesting results that I'm going to omit. Uh, but I think my main message for today is that we, um, when we jointly study EQTLs with um, no matter GWAS or other information, you have to be aware that EQTLs are very dynamic. Simply taking one set may not be enough. Uh, you may consider multiple tissue types, multiple cell types. Is this a tissue specific or is it a cross tissue EQTL? Um, moving beyond the EQTL, when you jointly consider other omics data types, there are various other challenges. So our best bet is to be comprehensive. But when you be comprehensive, multiple testing is going to be an issue. So you want some simultaneous modeling. Um, we presented some ideas like Primo, like the hierarchical latent low rank. Um, and those methods are not motiv are motivated by EQTL or multi-omics QTL, but could also be generalized to mediation or um, other settings. So I'll probably stop here and uh, We'll take questions. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, I wish we could give you a huge uh, round of applause. But uh, same here. I wish I have another hour to share the research that I'm interested in. Thanks. Um, and thank you so much to our audience who's joined us. Uh, the talk has been recorded and will be made available. If you'd like a copy, please feel free to email me. Um, Mingyao Li will be joining us as our moderator for the Q and A portion, and um, so if you could turn your attention over to her. And um, again, please use the chat if you have any questions. I saw Yosef had a question there. And um, Mingya, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for giving a wonderful talk. Uh, I see that Yosef uh, has a question. Uh, Yosef, uh, do you want to unmute yourself? Or do you want me to read the question? Uh, sure, yeah. can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, so I was asking about the mediation, which looks like a, a, a very nice idea um, as a concept. I was wondering whether that would lead you to identify associations that are related to specific effects or mechanisms uh, in comparison to others. So the example that I wrote there is, if I understood correctly, the concept is, uh, for example, you have a SNP that would affect the expression level of a transcription factor. So you will see an effect in cis, that would be your mediator, right? That's the recis. And then the trans, because there's going to be a whole bunch of genes that are affected because of that. So these kinds of underlying mechanisms would be, uh, the identification of them would be facilitated with the kind of uh, mediation analysis that you proposed if I, if I followed it uh, correctly. But if, for example, that SNP affected the binding domain of the transcription factor, so you see no effect on the expression, you will not be able to detect any of those in mediation. So those types of mechanisms would be lost, right? Because there is no cyst to capture there. The genetic variant is just affecting the binding domain. That's it, right? That's all that's happening, right? So is, is that interpretation true? Can you comment about that? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think so. Uh, we, uh, first of all, um, I think we try to sell this still as an association. So although we use the mediation framework, but the goal is still trying to detect the trans association. We didn't claim this is potentially putative causal. Um, so, um, 
in some sense, if it's just a SNP associated with a true causal variable and then have this uh, mediation effect, um, it may not be a true causal, but it's a true trans association. Um, and we are trying to sell it as a, a complementary approach to the direct testing for total effects. Because what we see in the literature is people usually still do the total, total effect tests first, identify the trends, and then through their significant trans pairs, um, they do an enrichment test to say, oh, half of my trends are at least with some partial uh, mediation effect from the cis gene. Um, so they try to do it that way. But we are trying to argue that the fact that you first do total test will more likely to detect those strong total effects, but majority of them are tissue specific. So, uh, and also replicated very poorly. There are many literature trying to um, echo this point too. Those uh, very, very strong tissue specific effects represent uh, replicated poorly across different cellular types. Um, and when people trying to use those QTLs in like a two sample uh, analysis framework or using summary level data, it's an issue because a lot of times you implicitly assume the effect is shared across many different conditions. Um, but through mediation analysis, like I said, it's not a replacement for the total test, but really are complementary it's just another different way to detect those weak signals that potentially are moderate in one tissue, but they are more um, persistent. And so when you aggregate across multiple conditions, you were able to detect it. Mm -hmm. Does that um, answer your, your question? No, I mean, it's, it's a good reasoning why to do it, for sure. Um, so in terms of the confounders, I think um, this is one limitation in the mediation analysis. It's assuming that the confounding has been adjusted for. Um, and uh, um, I think there are possible local confounders that may not be captured by PC, may not be captured by peer factors. And this is just something that uh, we have to take as a limitation of those um, uh, mediation analysis. But at least it's giving you some um, results to explore for, for further study. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, another question from uh, Diane Taylor. Uh, Diane, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to know how could these methods be expanded to longitudinal analyses, like looking at the effects of uh, EQTLs over development uh, and also in tissue. Is that just adding another dimension or would that be something that would have to, you'd have to rewrite the method? I think um, it depends on the data structure. Um, if, there, if there is just a multi-tissue component, uh, sorry, if there is just a um, developmental component, I think primo may be, especially if uh, the, you only observe um, less than 10 of those different stage, maybe it can be directly applied because PRIMO allows uh, correlated studies. If you think one time of the developmental stage is one study, um, essentially what PRIMO currently do is allowing repeated measures from different subsets of tissues. Um, and now you're allowing different um, time points um, and it, Primo doesn't assume um, those effects to be follow the same distribution. They don't even need to be from the same omics data type. So it can be applied there. Um, but once you have not just the, the longitudinal, um, um, maybe EQTL, maybe you also have longitudinal methylation QTL, there will be another layer of correlation. You can apply our later algorithm um, the hierarchical LLR. Currently, it doesn't have a software yet, but will be available very soon, I hope by the end of this year. Um, that way, it will not only account the 
correlation among the same omics data, but also um, allow correlation of different omics data types, allow the, the structure in a hierarchical way. So if you think multi-tissue is essentially like a repeated measure, and it's similar that methods can analyze GTAX data may also be able to analyze the uh, longitudinal QTL. Thank you. I actually have a question uh, in, uh, for your first work. Uh, I know that uh, GTAX recently did the deconvolution analysis. Uh, they estimated uh, sub-proportions uh, uh, of each tissue, and they included the estimated sub-proportions as the covariates identify the so-called cell-type-specific EQDLs. Have you thought about incorporating such type of uh, EQDL results uh, into your PRIMO framework? Um, it, uh, I think that's, that's a, a very valid potential things to try. We didn't. Um, I think one reason is we know that uh, when you estimate a cell type proportion, cell, um, cell type specific QTL, they, um, how to say, they're doing a very good job for major cell types. For those rare cell types, there are lots of estimation uncertainty. Um, it's still a open area how to uh, accurately estimate the cell type specific cell types in those cases. Um, so you can see that our general idea is still trying to classify those EQTLs into two broader categories, tissue specific or subsets tissue specific, like uh, brain tissue specific or um, metabolism related tissue specific or self by sex tissue specific um, or, or cross tissue. So. Um, you can you can think that we can definitely take their summary statistic and apply it. Um, I feel like there are more dimension in the cell type specific QTL than tissue specific QTL. Plus, there is also estimation uncertainty. So yeah, estimation uncertainty is a very challenging issue to deal with. Yeah, we could we could try. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, just a quick question about the mediation, maybe a continuous question. That's the uh, uh, um, last question. Like, uh, you use the mediation analysis to still to investigate the association, as you mentioned, SNP to the trans gene. Uh, I'm just wondering why do you think your method would be more powerful uh, based on the mediation analysis? Because uh, uh, to me, mediation analysis is mainly aimed to uh, like the isolates the you know the direct effect and the indirect effect within the procedure, so they just want to see different components and uh, how the effects are. But um, if if we are still interested in you know the total association, why do you think the mediation analysis would power up your you know analysis? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, that's a very good question. Maybe I um, didn't elaborate uh, very well. Um, we think in general. Mediation analysis is not necessarily increase your power, but the biology shows that most of the tissue specific EQTL are, uh, sorry, most of the, the uh, trans EQTL with a very strong effects are so tissue specific. The effects, it's like a winner's curse that if you, you can survive the uh, very stringent multiple testing and the and then um, be reported as a trans EQTL, you see that in the GTAX consortium, when they try to replicate their trans EQTL, it, the replication rate is very low. And it's not just the GTAX, many other studies report the same too. So when that effect, the, the total effect is so strong and survive the multiple testing, you're um, not very likely, winner's curse, you're not very likely to replicate them very well. Um, and power is another issue. Um, so here, our idea is more um, not trying to say we are more powerful, but we are 
getting, you can, you can see our replication study, we are getting the results that are more likely to um, be replicated um, and show consistent effects even when we detect those uh, trans relationships in the GTAX brain tissue, uh, we can replicate it in the blood tissue from EPPL gene. We can see a substantial enrichment of replication in the brain, but the disease, the tissue. So those are different. Those are two different studies with two different um, tissue types. Um, and if you compare with the results from um, Total's um, um, trans effects test, um, they're not going to be replicated. And then the reason why our results can be replicated is it's more like a biological reason. It's because mediation, um, essentially, you need to set aside two conditions. One is cis association. And already a, a large proportion of cis association is replicable. This is constantly being shown. And the second condition is gene gene correlation. And gene gene total expression correlation tend to be shared in functionally related tissue types. So we are trying to detect, it's not really about methods power comparison, rather we are trying to detect the type of signal that was missed by the, the direct test, the total test. Um, but those type of signals are more likely to be replicated. Okay, got it. thank you. So by the way, is, the, is, is, is this work published, uh, can be searched online? Uh, I, mean, it, I, I can send you a, I think we might have um, made it available on BioArchive, uh, but uh, it's in revision in uh, bioinformatics. I can send you a manuscript. Oh, that would be great. Thank you. If you send me an email. Yeah, yeah sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Primo you is so published. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is there someone speaking? Uh, I cannot see who is speaking. Uh, uh, since we are running out of time already, uh, if uh, no further questions, uh, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, I forgot to thank my class. Hey, Lynn, thank you again. I'll be in touch uh, through email, okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know how to stop the screen sharing. I forgot to thank my collaborator. Which is <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm recording still, so it's, you got it. <laughs> All Thanks. Right. All right, bye. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.